Okay, yes, thank you very much. Next up, we have Miles Dillon from Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, sponsored by Immudex. And the title of the talk is Multiplexing Oligodetrimers to Pair TCR Specificities with Phenotypes. All right, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all attendees uh, sticking around for this talk, I appreciate it. Uh, so I'm in the oncology group at Regeneron, and so I'm going to tell you about an assay technique that we have been refining using the decodextromers from Imidex. And in our group, we really care a lot about T cell functionality and antigen specificity within those T cells and putting forth a lot of effort to identify and characterize phenotype the T cell specificities that exist for viral tumor antigens and other diseases really can enhance a deep understanding of the immune response in human disease, not just in oncology, uh, which the group I'm in, but also vaccine responses to infectious disease, T cell responses in allergy and other avenues to treat. And so historically, when people are looking at T cell specificity and that the specific epitopes uh, 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 identified with any T cell, it was limited to essentially a, profiling a single epitope per sample. Uh, you would have an HLA epitope, um, tetramer, pentamer, mul a multimer of some sort that was singly labeled with a fluorescent marker and you would sort that cell or do a deep phenotype on that one type of cell, that one type of T cell clone. Um, and that was very prohibitive when you're looking at T cell frequencies of very low frequency uh, because you would need a large sample of blood or tissue to be able to isolate sufficient cells for sequencing. I uh, just simply couldn't get enough of that single clone. Uh, so new technologies that are available now in terms of multiplexing these oligo barcoding for deeper sample analysis really lets you combine very a lot of different specificities together in the same sample to really profile what's happening. So the approach we used is using the decodextromer from Imidex, which are a lot of these MHC molecules along a, back, a backbone, each loaded with a single peptide antigen, uh, fluorochrome PE, and then a DNA barcode so that you can uniquely identify each individual uh, epitope that is being profiled. And so a different DNA barcode can be associated with a different peptide antigen to let you profile many, many different specificities in the same sample. Uh, it really just is a beautiful way to optimize for very small amounts of blood, especially if you're looking at clinical trial samples where frequently you have one, two, maybe three mils of blood total to profile rather than healthy donor controls where you get a lot more. So in the study that I'm going to show you data from, we used a pool of 23 of these unique oligodextromers really to profile uh, peripheral T cells in both an HLA matched and mismatched fashion to uh, and th take them to single cell sort sorting to look at these antigen specific T cells. And so how it really works, uh, you know, I briefly described DNA barcode attached to uh, a backbone of a whole lot of peptide MHCs and unique uh, peptide associated with it for each specificity that you want to look at. You generate a library of these many, you know, each of these colors denotes a different peptide here. Essentially mix them all together, mix them with your cells, stain them as you would, you know, a normal tetramer, pentamer staining, and then sort out multiple positive cells and go for sequencing. And so this, the group, the Hadrop and colleagues, used a number of these individual epitopes to profile responses in uh, melanoma patients. And so each column here is the antigen specificity is present in the peripheral blood for a unique melanoma patient. And then the darker the red is, the higher the read detected from the individual antigens. And they see, you know, what would you would expect from profiling individual epitopes where a lot of viral reactivity down here, some flu and EBV responses, 
but then also responses that are specific to antigens expressed on melanoma cells, such as MART1, NYESO, uh, MAGE in here as well. We don't need to get into the specifics of these antigens, but really able in one sample able to profile, you know, I don't even know the total number that are in here, 50, 60 different antigens for each individual patient and uh, sequence what's happening the spe phenotypically for that specific T cell. And so we use this concept with the decodextromers to uh, use it, reform an assay in our own hands, where we'll take those labeled cells, similar as I described, you know, the uh, <laughs> cartoon diagram of flow sorting here, taking our live cells and our CD8s and then any dextromer positive and putting them in the same 10x single cell sequencing that was just talked about. Uh, and running it through our system, uh, to single cell sequence, identify, decode, deconvolute which dex uh, dextromers are positive for which cells and take them for our own analysis. And so here's the full panel of epitopes that we looked at in this study, um, covering a wide, you know, pretty wide range of different HLA haplotypes going down and a different, uh, a wide range of viral and uh, different uh, cancer-associated antigens. And we used a donor that we had a known haplotype that was AO2, O1 positive and other things. So we were able to profile a lot of AO2, O1 matched epitopes, but also look at cross reactivity for other epitopes. Uh, importantly, we wanted to see how much you know, essential stickiness between the different pool existed and what we were able to deconvolute. And this donor we had profiled with individual oligodextromer stains in the past. And so we knew it was distinctly positive for a number of these different AO201 epitopes that it, we included in this panel, uh, such as the flu M peptide here with a good number of positive cells, especially the CMV PP65. And so knowing these uh, individual dextromer responses, we were able to correlate what's happening at the single level versus our pool of 23. Additionally, within that pool of 23, we included two negative controls that just had non, no binding. Uh, one AO201 peptide and one, uh, so that's matched, and then one mismatched uh, B801. So the process for sorting these, uh, you know, we mix them all together, pull them, and then these are the individual sorts that we got off the machine. So our uh, FMO, uh, one single PP65, so just only the PP65 peptide in this case, uh, came up with a pretty high population for a single dextromer staining of 0.53. And you compare that to our pool of 23 dextromers, uh, which pretty similar number, 0.45 in this case, but also a very distinct sortable population that we got off our machine. Additionally, we sorted uh, the total T CD8 T cells to get a repertoire control for various sequencing analyses. And then as a, another control, we expanded out for 14 days uh, cells from this donor with the MART1 peptide in order to truly expand and enhance the number of MART1 specific cells to sort those out that should be a much more clean population for a single multimer in that case. And then from that also spiked in 5% of these MART1, this expanded population here into our 23 dextromer sort to see what, to profile if the, how that uh, spiking affected our reads coming out. And then putting it through the sequencing, this is essentially the UMI reads going across the bottom for each of the individual dextromers. And you can see this big spike of the CD8 population that essentially had zero uh, reads for the multimers themselves, which is what should happen when you're talking about looking at 0.4 or 5% of the population versus the entire rest of it, the number of UMI reads really aren't going to show up. If you zo zoom in down on where the actual you know, meat of the matter is happening here, you look at the number of reads detected for different populations. And so the 23 dextromer pool had a very nice clean UMI reads present in 
almost every single cell out there, very few come out in this no dexmer size, showing the efficiency of the staining and sorting. Uh, the same thing seen with the 23 dexmer pool with the MART1 spike in this purple. Uh, and then the MART1 expanded population itself also had very distinct reads separate from the no UMI population down here. A uh, lower overall number of reads versus the total population, but that simply could be a result of the T cell clones binding less efficiently, those T cell clones themselves expressing lower TCRs, maybe that one dextromer just not being as efficient itself for that one peptide. There are a number of reasons. And so from this sequence population, we did some basic analysis uh, in terms of clustering of what we're seeing. And so if you look at the total CD8 T cell population, so that repertoire control, where there were very, very few uh, UMI reads detected for the dextromers themselves, which is what should happen, uh, all the T cells cluster pretty nicely together, except for a little population out there and very few other contaminants such as neutrophils. And compare that to what's happened in the dextromer sorted pool. Pretty much the same kind of thing, very tight clustering, all the T cell is getting there together, really showing the specificity of the sort that you're able to get out from this staining. Just a few B cells and neutrophils popping out, out there. Now importantly, this technique is compatible with a number of other DNA barcoded technologies such as SiteSeq. And so we included uh, antibodies with different unique DNA barcodes specific for CD3, CD8, um, CD4, granzyme H uh, in, in the entire process. And you could see very strong unique staining for CD3, CD8 since we stored it out CD8 T cells. Nothing coming up for the CD4. Really, this technique, proving that this te technique is applicable for many different DNA barcodes mixed around together. And then from this population, the 23 dextromers, just looking at gene enrichment, and what happens is exactly what we'd expect. Each cluster is specific for a specific um, dextromer, or at least it seems that way, because the clustering is driven primarily by the TCR genes expressed by each clone that's out there. And you basically looking down this list, anytime you see TR, it's the uh, T cell receptor gene. And so uh, looking at the next step for this analysis, the oligodextromers, uh, they really identify the highly clonal populations of our viral specific T cells. And so on the left uh, is a heat map basically on the clone size of each specific TCR. The, dark, the more purple, the higher the number of clone sizes. And what you see is the vast majority are quite clonal population, which is exactly what you would expect when you're doing just a directly ex vivo uh, dextromer binding. The, anything that you've been exposed to that has expanded in the periphery is going to be a very highly clonal population. That's where our CMV, EBV, viral specific epitopes come from. And on the right is another way to look at that clonality, breaking it down by our different sorted pools in this case, uh, looking at the frequency of any clone versus the size of any clone. Uh, and then the blue here is the repertoire control. You see a couple high frequencies, but pretty much going, or I'm sorry, low frequencies, and then going down uh, as the uh, where the repertoire is versus the purple for the dextromer pool, that 23 dextromers that we sorted. Uh, very sharp contrast where we have a much higher number of clones isolated in there at higher frequencies. And then our mixed MART1 um, expanded population falls somewhere in the middle because there are fewer uh, dextromers that were in there. Um, so it's much more specific re that you're seeing. Uh, and importantly, what we can detect in these dextromer enrichments correlates directly with what we know in terms of the T cell reactivities in our orthogonal assays. Uh, so, so mentioned before that we stained all of these with the individual dextromers as well to know what our populations look like. 
And then each of these numbers are the number of total T cells detected within each dextmer from our pooled population. And that's over here on the right in this table, where for each uh, dextmer that's a row, the number of total T cells we detected and the number of unique clones that we detected within it. Um, and so you can see that when we have a pretty big population for our dextmer positive single um, stain for like the PP65CMV, that's our highest population of T cell clones. Also, a significant uh, in our EBB BMLF clone, high number of T cells that were found there, and so on and so forth. Uh, and getting down into the single detected uh, T cell clone associated with the HPV. Uh, 16E7, one, one T cell was found, you know, obviously one unique clone at that point, and pretty much we'll say no binding seen at the single dextromer level in this case. You know, we wouldn't uh, call that positive usually. And this also correlates with the functional response of these specific cells. And so if you stimulate with that unique peptide, uh, that epitope for PP65 or some of these others, in a an LE spot format where it's just PBMCs adding in the peptide and then letting it cook and measuring the amount of interferon gamma secreting spots after a couple days. You see a high number of spots associated with the PP65 peptide, which is our highest by far number of total T cells detected. And then similar above background level detected for the BMLF, the flu M, and the lymph 2A, which have those lower numbers, but still detectable number of T cell clones. I will say that we, it's not on here, but then we don't detect uh, in by LE spot at the four or three level, suggesting that the de pool dextromer itself is just a higher sensitivity to identify these specific T cells. Now you'll also note these are, uh, this table is the summary of all detected binding events and the only HLA haplotype that showed up uh, when it came to deconvolution was the AO201, which were of all of our different haplotypes that we included in the pool, that was the only haplotype that our donor possessed. Uh, it's really showing the specificity that you were able to get from the dextromer pool that there's not a lot of just dextromer dextromer interaction that gives you high background. Uh, we didn't detect any AO301 or A11, B08 within this donor. And so when you actually then break down our, the T cell clones that we identified here, uh, so these are just the CDR3s, you don't need to know these sequences, but for each individual clone that we detected going this way, and then our top dextromers within each pool, virtually every single TCR was only detected with a single dextromer. Really no evidence for broad cross reactivity that you see on the surface of any one cell, there might be dextromer dextromer interaction that's leading to false reads. We detected almost none of that. Uh, you can see just nice high percentages going across and big the clone size here just by the size of the dots, uh, primarily for our PP65 PCMV peptide, that was just our highest number of clones. Also for our EBV, uh, the exception being our, the MART1 Multimer popped up on this clone. This is from our spiked sample. And so we suspect it's simply that there's such a high frequency of these multiple uh, MART1 clones that just caused a tiny bit of uh, cross reactivity. When we look at our non MART1 spiked sample, this does not appear. And so, oh, finishing a little early. Uh, so conclusions that using these uh, decodextromers in a pool format, uh, we're able to detect single uh, T cell clones, even at a single T cell number level, a single T cell uh, within a big sorted pool. Uh, we've done 23 now, we've gone up to 50 uh, decodextromers and things that are looking pretty clean. And so this technique just enables a really highly multiplexed uh, sequencing profile of antigen specificity within your T-cell phenotype. 
really getting in-depth look at what's happening in that person with a from minimal amount of sample. You know, you do the same thing and you would need 10 million cells for each Duxmer looked at, where now you can look at 50 and you know, just five to 10 million cells. And that multiplexing really allows that detection of those low frequency T cell specificities that you wouldn't look be able to find in any other level. Uh, you can't you know, uh, other techniques won't let you pull out that single T cell clone all by itself for sequencing. It just wouldn't work. And so as we keep going with this, we want to see how far we can push it. Uh, we've done 23, we've done 50. Can we increase that number of dextromers in the panel up to 100, 500? Really, what's the limit? Uh, we don't, don't know, haven't been tried yet. And we're currently applying this technique in a variety of our clinical trials looking longitudinally along with treatment with uh, our various drugs to de really determine changes in phenotypes of antigen-specific T cells and how our drugs might take advantage of that or maybe even other uh, ways to combine different drugs or new targets that might be found within it. And this work was done by a whole lot of different people and especially like to think, uh, thank people within the Antic group, such as Say and Jessica for helping out with this. Uh, a, lo a lot of people are Regeneron nomenclature profiling, and of course, Imidex for helping us design many, many different uh, Dextromers as we're doing this entire process. And thank all of you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for a really great talk, Miles. We really appreciate it. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that you can utilize that Q&A function for any questions that you might have. And um, that being said, we'll get going with our first question. So uh, Remy Crusoe uh, asked if, uh, is this technique, this technique is very dependent on available reagents, often restricted to specific, uh, mostly, uh, most commonly HLA haplotypes. In what direction do you think in expansion will go? Uh, more antigens, more haplotypes, or more disease models, for example, autoimmune TCRs? Yeah, uh, more disease models, that's an easy answer. It, it could be applied across anything, provided you know what antigen you want to look at. If you could get sample, you can use this technique on it. That shouldn't be an issue. Um, new, any new antigen that you order, uh, essentially, maybe a custom one you, you want to look at. You need to know the epitopes you want to care about and the HLA haplotypes. Uh, but provided you know that, uh, we have not had a failed uh, production of any custom dextromer yet. Um, you know, everything that we request is highly predicted to bind to the HLA haplotypes and everything's worked out for us. Uh, but you do need to know the epitopes and the haplotypes you want to care about. Uh, there are some HLA haplotypes, especially when you get into the rare alleles, that are not as easily produced uh, in terms of a soluble protein, and that can be limiting. Uh, but most of the, I get most of the most the mo the most common HLA alleles are available, uh, and so really, it's whatever you want to custom order. This should be able to work on it. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for that explanation and the answer. Um, so I have a question. Um, you know, I'm wondering if there are, I, I've had very limited experience with, with dextromers, but um, what I can remember, if I can remember correctly, is that um, there might be special considerations with staining. So I'm curious, um, you know, if you're working with a, um, a multicolor panel, do you have to take into consideration the timing for when you actually add in the dextromer and is there uh, like kind of like a step-by-step -step process for when you'd add in other CD markers and stuff like that as opposed to uh, as opposed to when you'd add in the dextromers and then would there be any special considerations in regards to blocking or anything like that like FC blocking? Yeah I, the, I mean essentially we use the Immudex uh, protocol for their dextromers uh, that seems to work at the single dextromer level and the uh, pool of dextromers as well. Uh, we do do separate staining for our fluorescent surface antibodies uh, versus the dextromers, uh, essentially dextromers first, couple washes, and then the surface antibodies. Uh, and we try to keep, you know, like I'm sure all of us try to keep our sorting panels as small as possible 
just to avoid any interference back and forth since you know by default uh, you know seeing half a percent of dextrin positive is a huge number and i wouldn't expect to get much higher than that special considerations past that in terms of you know, when we get into the we've tried 23 50 dextrimers now but if you get into the hundreds and hundreds combined uh it that's a totally separate question and we simply don't know yet if the techniques themselves will have to be refined to handle that kind of just staining. Um, there, there might be tricks of the trade to work out at that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, great, thank you, Kix. I, I do remember that, you know, at, at one point or another, that by switching up the order, there was some issues with, uh, with it coming up, so that's good to know. Um, and then I was curious as to, you know, the availability of fluorochromes for these uh, dextromers, and then have you found, or has Immunex found potentially, I know it might be hard for you to speak for them. <laughs> um, if, I don't think I'm allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't think so either. Um, but just if, if you have any knowledge of, um, you know, molecular weight of certain fluors has any impact on, on how these dextromers perform, and just the fluorochromes available in general. Uh, We've only used the PE uh, in this pool form so far, uh, so I ha we haven't tried any others. And I, yeah, you know, like like you said, I don't want to speak for Imidex for any issues they've had with different conjugations. I, I don't have any information about that. Okay, well, I'd imagine PE is a, is a fairly large molecular weight in comparison to some of the other um, to some of the other fluorochromes. Yeah. So Good, good to know. About if PE works, you know, smaller ones should, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, and then uh, just out of curiosity, have you tried um, doing any of the dextromer work on any uh, imaging platforms like the Amnes, or do you think there's a possibility for it to be expanded out for mass cytometry or anything like that? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, we haven't tried it. I want to try it, uh, and I absolutely think it can work in the systems. Yeah. Do you think there would be any challenges there or anything like special considerations for taking it to other platforms? Overall, no. I mean, there's always small considerations, but I, I think it, it should be pretty directly comparable uh, or applicable to them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there'll be small techniques to work out and differences, but nothing, nothing major from my perspective on it. Okay, wonderful. Well, I think that's all of the... Um, Oh, we have one more question, actually. <laughs> um, perfect, because we have about two or three more minutes left. Um, so Lydia Tesfa had asked, uh, well, first she said, great talk. Um, we agree on that. And then she was asking if there was any um, issue with nonspecific background staining, um, you know, maybe with too much dextromer um, or, any, or anything like that. Uh, not in terms of too much dextromer. We have, you know, we've tried a number of, I only showed you data from one donor. We've tried a number at this point. We tried one one time that was uh, essentially a completely HLA mismatched version. And we did find uh, some, I'll, I'll call it background binding that came up because we were able to sort positive cells that just seemed to be uh, a mixture of random dextromers that came out. The percentage positive um, inter uh, on the flow for that one donor was very, very small. Um, and a very bad shift away from the general population. I mean, it was basically a learning for us to move that gate pretty far away from the general population because you might get some of that background there. Uh, but then anytime we had a HLA matched pool, that problem went away. Okay, interesting. Yeah, that's definitely an interesting um, consideration when talking about like rigor and reproducibility and making sure that others can, um, can reproduce the results with... Um, with good outcomes. So that's definitely a good comment. So thank you.